six. Edward Glisson said it, I repeat, opacity. Own it. We've been led to believe that the mind is in the brain, but the mind is mapped across the entire body. The body is what moves us into action. We can have any kind of thought, but it is embodiment that moves us to change, moves us to take action, moves us to generate community. Welcome to Black Manifesto, The Ten Commandments. Black Women Speak Out, a podcast series hosted by Nora Shipamere and myself, Paulette Brooks. Black Manifesto brings together voices of black women from around the world as a collective conversation, making the invisible visible and addressing how we work to reshape a new world in which black women are seen and heard. The guests on this podcast share their reflections unapologetically, so please be aware of uses of strong language and references to personal struggles and traumas. In this sixth episode, Dr. S. Amare sparks insight on the importance of improvisation, ownership, and how we really embrace embodyology, while she contextualizes the sixth commandment. Edward Glissard said it, I repeat, opacity, own it. So let's start from the beginning of your journey. What are the bodily steps that you have taken to reach where you are today? Well, that's a really great question, Paulette. So where have I reached today? In your mind, where have I reached? Where am I? Where are you in my mind and from a UK perspective? Actually, I think it's fantastic that you work in the States and you also work in the UK and you also work in Africa. And so for me, you've put the D back in diaspora. And so that's absolutely fantastic in terms of how we should have a coming together. But that's my view. What we're here today is to hear your views. Sure. You know, there's many ways I could answer the question. So I like the the D back in diaspora. So I can thread my history to connect those points. So I'm going to start from my present moment, which is we're in COVID, but if I were not, I would be traveling around the diaspora. I'd be traveling to Ghana. I'd be traveling to the UK. I'd be probably somewhere in the Caribbean and different parts of the United States. And what has sort of propelled me here uh, are a series of decisions that I, I made in my career and opportunities that I also received. So When I received the Anesta Fellowship in 2000, it was after I'd finished my master's degree. So after I had completed, if you will, a period of time of working freelance after leaving London Contemporary Dance Theatre and Rombe, I then was working with my own company, Jazz Exchange, and then I needed to step back and take a breath because I felt like there was some disconnect between what I saw myself as doing and how people were receiving what I was doing. So I was working in jazz. I was working with jazz musicians. I was bringing improvisation into the lexicon of performance. I was bringing musicians on stage. I was working with jazz music. I was working with the top British jazz musicians like Gary Crosby and so on. And I was working with a mixed cast of dancers. So both those that would be seen as black and those that would be seen as white. And I was working with the people who had the talent and the interest in the work I was doing. And no doubt this work was rooted in a soulfulness that comes from African diasporic traditions where music and dance are combined. Okay, so I've always had this real strong connection with music and that stems back to my living room, dancing with my mother, you know, aged four probably, and starting to exhibit, you know, aspects of performance, you know, when family comes certain times of the year and we we gather and I both dance with my mum, but also like to exhibit. And I was already aware that I was making up my own dances, but also around that time I kind of connected with musicals and I love to watch musicals. I love tap dancing in particular. Again, this kind of musical 
way of relating to sound and embodying sound and the joy of that. So those parts of me have continued to be present, even though I dance with a modern dance company in the UK, contemporary dance in the UK in the in the late 80s and through the 90s. And in those spaces, I was working with choreographers from all over the world, but none from the diaspora. So there was always a part of me that wasn't fulfilled in those spaces. And it was as I started to do my own work and continue with a line of my training, which was in jazz, but I disrupted that because I didn't see the opportunities for me to get work in the spaces where jazz had currency, so the West End. There were not too many brown women. In fact, there was one or maybe two, and you had to have a great singing voice to get a leading role. And I didn't have a great singing voice, and I really didn't want to dance the back, and I really didn't want all of that stress to not get cast. So I pivoted and went into contemporary dance, which was deeply fulfilling, but there was always this piece that was missing. So with that piece that was missing, what you were then looking at was your well-being. But what about the vitality and the empathy? If we think about those words as well, and the fact that you're touching on curiosity, could you tell me why it's important to embrace a critical thinking that encouraged your curiosity and therefore had an impact on your well-being? Can you talk about that a little bit more? Could you talk about the bits that were missing? Sure. And I think I've always been sort of two-handed in the sense that, you know, I've been academically engaged and also artistically engaged, and they're not mutually exclusive, but in my world, they were very intimately tied together. So I was studying sociology and government and politics whilst I was studying dance. And so as I was progressing in life, I was also looking at Black politics and seeing the parts of my history that I wasn't aware of when I was at college. So those moments were being exposed to me whilst I was studying dance. And so my world opened up. So my world was never just confined to the studio. And so as I started to learn about different aspects of my culture and my heritage, started to, in some ways, question some of the things that I've been socialized in at home, for example. You know, that Africa is this place and people that I shouldn't be involved in and with. You know, that's a Caribbean story. And the same narrative happens here. You know, there is this, and maybe it's something to do with the migrants, right? or somehow to do with the colonial story of of Africa being a place of unknowns and full of obia and full of things that we would deem not, not advancing for us in this way of living in modern society, that that's behind us and those ways are not for us. And so we cut ourselves off from that root and as I started to inquire and see, see what the world was really made of, I started to test those waters and inquire and look at spirituality in dance. So, you know, taking those ideas and bringing them back into the space of dance. So that's what led me to Cuba. And it was after being exposed to Cuban dance in the UK that I was able to go and My whole world changed after I I visited Cuba. I mean, everything about what I perceived was so minuscule. It just flowered. And it was, in in fact, my gateway to Africa. And it was also my gateway to understanding, you know, that some of the things that we've conditioned ourselves with that are endemically, you know, they're the purview of blackness or this is the purview of whiteness, Well, in Cuba, you know, life is very mixed, Matisse. People live together, people worship together, people dance together from all different ethnic backgrounds. And the race story is there in Cuba. Don't get me wrong, it's not invisible. 
but the ways in which people occupy their bodies isn't denoted by race in the same way as it is, you know, when we look at how we perceive plants in the West in general. So in terms of opening your eyes and then having an opportunity to look at the gaze and the gaze coming from another perspective, how did that shape your view in terms of the importance of ownership in your practice? Interesting. So I think the moment you start making work, you become conscious that you're speaking with your own voice. And as we have moved into this very um, advanced space of sharing information, like information gets shared in milliseconds, and where are the origin points of this information? They're obscured immediately at the same time as things get moved around. But my journey to see where where African knowledge had been transferred and translated and had grown anew and was decidedly Cuban, if you will, was also a gateway to understanding how a movement culture can be valued by the larger culture like really valued it's not seen as peripheral it's not seen as something that is uh just done for entertainment or it's just peripheral to the society that it's valued by the society and the and it's really cherished and recognized as part of their inheritance and as we see fashions change we as African peoples around the world, we have been shunted because of commercialism, partly to abandon what we have created, right? Because we are creating the next thing so that we can remain current and have currency with those people that then borrow from what we create in order to be relevant. And then there are these other people in the background who are archiving what we've done. <laughs> and with that archive, they then get to label, categorize, and place other kinds of value on what we've created. Meanwhile, we've abandoned it, we've lost our connection to a lot of it, and we keep on moving forward. So seeing that on my journey, I had the awesome <laughs> the awesome opportunity to spend time with people in a village setting in Ghana and I learned from them and I learned some of the real fundamental principles that I teach now in embodyology and that reciprocal learning came over a period of time whereby I was seeing how people lived and how they exchanged and as a researcher of course, I found these jewels. But as I was researching, I was really cognizant this was really precious information. Like this wasn't something that you could just stumble upon. This comes because I was, you know, entrenched, enmeshed, and they trusted me. And so with that, as I made those discoveries, I made it very, very clear to myself that Whenever I'm sharing this information, I must bring the root with me. And then I must reciprocate and give back to that community, which led me on to actually creating intellectual property around embodyology. So that there is an onus, there's a responsibility ethically, morally, ancestrally to give back, to be clear about where the genesis of these ideas and this philosophy stems from. So I'm gonna follow on a little bit more with Glissant, who talks about opacity as the force that drives every community, the thing that would bring us together forever and make us permanently distinctive. How do we continue to build a community and leadership through movement sourced from an Africanist approach? How do we continue to lead from? 
I think we remember that it's the breath that generates the movement and it's the breath that keeps us all alive. And it's the breath that then creates the rhythm, that creates the counter rhythm, that creates the engagement, the reciprocity, the call and response, it all comes from the breath. And the breath gives you the groundedness and the connection to the earth. I can't really answer much to that, to be quite honest, because that's just fabulous. But with all of that and the breath and how important it is to breathe and to move, why do we need community? I think that without community, we don't exist. So Ubuntu, I am because we are. Or as Jose Cosa would say, I am a person through other persons. I am a person because of persons. In fact, there is no other. Why is it important then to help our bodies think in order to change the way we navigate our thoughts? I think that's a fantastic question because we've been led to believe that the mind is in the brain, but the mind is mapped across the entire body. And the more of our bodies that we can enliven and pay attention to creates more synaptic connections in the brain that then process thought and then help us generate meaning. The body is what moves us into action. We can have any kind of thought, but it is embodiment that moves us to change, moves us to take action, moves us to generate community. So without the body, there is no processing. There is no next step. So with that embodiment and that movement and that thought, how do we affirm and honour and celebrate black experiences through the decolonisation of dance mythologies? We keep on remembering the significance of our dances and our musics and the combination we move towards the study of dance that isn't categorized in these lean ways that make it simply about something that is aesthetically produced for a staged space. We remember our dances have a whole myriad of purposes from healing to socializing to engendering partnerships to engendering community relationships. Our dances are about the cycles of life and they can enable our communities to remember, literally remember, put ourselves back together again, to remember joy, to change the chemical imbalances that we um, have experienced because there's been so many layers of trauma that have been baked in to our systems. Dance is a way for us to free ourselves and to remember the agency that we have. And through understanding your mobility and your mobilization of your rhythm, through your breath and your connection to others, so many things are possible. Intuition, perception and sensation. What is your interpretation of these three provocations? So our intuition is actually part of the continuum of thought. It's based on experience, right? Intuition is a a retrieval of histories, of memories. And it is a space that we feel somewhere in our bodies. And oftentimes, because we feel it, we can ignore it because it comes from a place that's not in the head. So the idea of, again, that the mind is mapped across the body, the brain is just one receiver, but the body itself, sensory matter, is also receiving and processing information. So our senses are not limited to those that are sensing the physical external world, but we have intersensory capacity. And we also have 
historical senses that we can awaken. You know, when we think about, oh, that is a familiar smell and the whole history back because of a particular fragrance. It can embody a whole time and place. So we have sensing for memory as opposed to just thinking about sensing as perceiving the outside world. So you talked a little bit about archiving and legacy and memory. What does legacy look like for you? A legacy looks like I am demonstrating the ways in which we can be connected across the diaspora and the continent. It looks like us getting into conversations that might be difficult, that might have been uncharted. It's giving credence, uh, giving foundational respect to the continent and its peoples and its ways. It's creating a space that in the future other people will be able to follow a map and deepen that inquiry and bring more to our consciousness that we're raising. Because as we raise our consciousness, we are raising the consciousness of the planet. So with raising the consciousness of the planet and thinking about it from a black female perspective, women, black women are always associated with strength and resilience. Tell me about a time that communal strength transcended through your practice. Communal strength transcends, I think, through life. I would say each time I share in bodyology, I see openings for people. I see transformations in progress. I see the capacities that were latent blooming. And I see then their relationship to their wider community. So these ideas potentially going into new spaces. So that capacity to coach, nurture, support, they are seen as strengths. But I also see that this work also gives me energy, gives me the wonder to keep exploring and you know I'm building a teacher training program for embodyology and so in some ways that's going to be an ongoing part of my legacy such that this work will transform itself through the people that learn these fundamentals and take them into various tributaries from people working with children, people working in performance, people working in the academic space, in the corporate space where embodiment is somewhat suppressed or denied. So I see that sort of those layers, those ripples uh, ongoing as a testimony of the work that keeps feeding me too. It's transforming me as well as I go about sharing this work. So it's a two-way process. Absolutely. You're giving and receiving simultaneously. Yes. So as with, um, I think this is becoming a tradition with uh, this project now, could you tell us what is your life lesson that you would like to share with others? That, that life lesson. Yes, I know it's another great question. Me, life <laughs> lesson. I think I'm, I'm still learning them is one. But I think that what you, what you, this is really a good one. What you keep at the front of your mind, what you imagine, what you imagine with your mind's eye, then translates into the actions that you will take. And so it's really important to have a vision for your life. And no matter what comes in and disrupts that, to maintain a vision for your life. Because often what happens is other people's actions impact on you, which rupture that vision that you have for your life, and then you are derailed. 
And so it's super important to have the vision and keep it at the front and do what you need to do to keep feeding that despite anything to the contrary. My dad um, wrote a poem called The Path I Knew. And actually, it just, it actually symbolizes what, what you've said, um, which is, yeah, quite, quite important to me. Um, so, yes, The Path I Knew, it's exactly what you've just said. And he, uh, he published that many moons ago. But on that note, um, this has just gone very quickly, I have to say. It was really, really, really insightful. And it was great to understand that whole notion of embodiology, improvisation, your passion, legacy, and also the important point of vision, you know, so vision and that clarity of vision. So thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for listening. You can read more about Black Manifesto in Black Ink, a new publication from Serendipity, which brings together international voices from the African and African Caribbean diaspora and indigenous communities to discuss black arts, heritage and cultural politics. In the next episode of Black Manifesto, Nora and I will be joined by Project X, a multidisciplinary dance collective for the next commandment, platform yourself and know when to de-platform yourself. The Black Manifesto podcast is sponsored by the National Education Union. This podcast was edited by Hannah Hethman and Julia Letts at Better Lemon Creative Audio, with research by Ms. Thora Allison and Amy Grain. For further information and context to support your own learning, visit our Resources for Change page at serendipity-uk.com. Thank you.